William Alfred Coyle was a minister in the Methodist Episcopal Church at the beginning of the 20th century. He truly was a man of God and was known as a collector of rare Bibles. His collection of Bibles can actually be found at Baker University, which is in Baldwin City, Kansas. Uh, Reverend Quayle graduated in 1888 from Baker University. I had the chance to actually visit that collection one day, and I was uh, some time ago, and I was quite impressed by it. Um, where else in Kansas can you see a page from the Gutenberg Bible? which was the very first book that was ever printed on the printing press. You can also see a Tyndall New Testament that was printed in 1549, a great Bible made for Henry VIII in 1539, a Geneva Bible from 1560, and two original King James Bibles from 1611. There are over 600 books in his collection. And I'd recommend, if you're ever up that direction toward Kansas City, uh, that you would visit Baker University and that collection is quite impressive. But of greater impact personally to me has been his writings. Among them, a volume entitled The Pastor Preacher. I copied on the flyleaf of one of my study Bibles this quote. Unless a man be a good lover of folks, he has no business at all in the ministry of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can imagine that Bishop Quayle was thinking about Paul and his ministry to the Thessalonians. We find ourselves this morning in the second chapter of Thessalonians, and our outline of the study can be very simply put into two parts. The first part is what Paul did not do in his ministry there. And the last part is what he did do. They also, this, these verses give us a standard by which we can evaluate ministers as well as churches. And I'd have to say at this point that as I read over this, that I found that there are a number of ways in which I was not as perfect as I would like to be. So as you can look at these, and as we go through these things, uh, you know, the Lord said, be perfect as I am perfect, and we all realize that God sets a standard way up here. I always wondered if God had said, be 90% perfect. Everybody would say, well, there's my 10% where I can fail. And God says, be completely perfect as a standard for us, and we all have are working toward that and realizing that we are imperfect. And I would admit I am an imperfect pastor and preacher, but I'm striving for being better. These verses also give us a pattern for successful Christian ministry at any level, as well as evaluating ourselves as believers. If chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians could be entitled Salvation, the second chapter could be entitled Service. Paul begins by reminding his readers of what they well, well, very well knew. He cites the proof of results. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2. For you yourself know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. And for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men. but God who examines the heart. There's a saying that goes like this, if someone thinks he's a leader, but no one is following, he's simply taking a walk. The ones reading this letter knew that Paul's ministry in their city was very successful, for their very existence 
as the church was proof. Their response to the preaching of the gospel was very evident as they had turned from idols and accepted the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And contrary to what most would expect, most would expect after being severely scourged and beaten, thrown into jail for preaching in Philippi, when Paul arrived in Thessalonica, he proceeded exactly to the synagogue of the Jews and boldly preached the same message that got him into trouble. And the results were much the same. Great opposition and great personal danger. An important key to successful ministry is boldness. The pioneer evangelist Peter Cartwright spent 70 years serving the Lord and he always preached the Word of God without fear or favor. One Sunday, he was asked to speak in a church in the southern part of the United States. And just before the message, he was informed that Andrew Jackson had just entered the sanctuary. He was cautious be very careful what he said, lest he offend their famous visitor. The evangelist, however, knowing that as Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of God brings a snare, was determined not to compromise the truth. He also knew that great leaders need the Lord as much as anyone, so he boldly proclaimed the gospel. In fact, halfway through his sermon, he said, I understand that Andrew Jackson is present in the congregation today. If he does not repent of his sins and accept the Lord Jesus as his personal Savior, he will be just as lost as anyone else who has never asked God for his forgiveness. Instead of becoming angry, Jackson admired the preacher for his courage. He listened with keen interest to the message. He felt such deep conviction that after the service, Cartwright was able to lead him to the Lord. From that moment on, the two became best friends. A holy boldness. Secret believers don't lead souls to Christ. And may we all pray for a holy boldness to share the gospel, even though we know at times it will be opposed. We understand that the truth is always intolerant of error. And this always, this opposition, will bring opposition to the gospel. Jesus spoke of the reason for such opposition and the truth when he told Nicodemus in John 3, And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. This speaks to our ministry today. We cannot embrace the culture's tolerance for evil. It's tolerance for anything goes. Calling right wrong and wrong right. We must boldly stand for biblical truth. I heard today, or read today, that the big problem today is truth decay. Verse 3 gives us a hint of how this opposition was accusing Paul in his message. He was accused of being in error when he fully pre preached that the law of Moses could not save anyone. Imagine how that went over in the Jewish synagogue. The law does not save anyone. The law is only valuable in pointing out that we are sinners. The Jews strongly resisted this message of grace, especially when it said that the Jew and the Gentile were on equal ground. As Paul preached to the Gentiles, he was accused of participating in their immoral pagan practices. They've been guilty by association. And a final accusation must have questioned, questioned his methodology. They accused him of winning followers by using underhanded methods. We look at the word, at the word exhortation in verse 3. It says, for our exhortation does not come from error. This word has a meaning of an earnest appeal 
perhaps a challenging word, but very interesting. It also has a meaning of comfort. The gospel boldly challenges sin. But it also contains the wonderful remedy of salvation. Relief from the dire consequences of sin, along with freedom from guilt. You see, the sinner lives in constant fear of his actions being found out. He lives in darkness, hiding, fearful of his skeletons in the closet being discovered. But what freedom, what freedom is found in admitting our sin and turning away from it and being relieved of the penalty from sin? The gospel has good news, but it also has bad news. Bad news for sinners. Good news, there's a solution for our, for our sin. Psalm 31, 32, 1 in the New Living Translation says, Oh, what joy for those whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Paul's defense, God approved the message which was proven by the results. God alone is the one that we must put, that we must please. For God is the one that examines us completely. And we need not fear the criticism of man. Look at verses 5 and 6. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. Even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. Paul was preaching with pure motives. You know, you can find a variety of motives among vocational ministers. Some view the ministry as simply a professional career. Some like the prestige and the influence of being a pastor. Some get into the ministry to please their parents. I know of one man whose mother pushed him into the ministry, although he proved to be psychologically unsuited for that stress. And after a mental breakdown and several years of counseling, he found a career that was much better suited for his personality. Unless a person is truly called of God, they shouldn't be preaching. I've heard it said, if you can be satisfied by doing anything else, other than preaching, you should do it. But Paul's motive for preaching was simply to fulfill the mission that God called him to. He explains in 1 Corinthians 9.16, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about, for I am under compulsion. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. You see, God had put a call upon him, and he was fulfilling that call. And he knew that he could not do anything but doing that. Whatever the motive for someone entering the ministry of preaching, there are constant pressures from the enemies of the gospel. Those enemies try to sidetrack the minister from saying centered on the word. In verse 5, we find the twin evils of yielding flattery on one side or yielding to covetousness. Flattery is something we easily know about. We all love to be flattered. For that really, our flesh really loves to be flattered. We all like someone saying, you're looking good today. Or to flatter us and give us a compliment. What a beautiful child you have. Now, is it wrong to give somebody a sincere compliment? What's the difference between compliments and flattery. Well, the difference is in the motive behind it. You see, flattery always has an ulterior motive. They're trying, someone that flatters someone is trying to use it in some way to get something from you. Paul said he didn't come with flattering speech in, in an attempt to win their attention. As did some of the gifted orators of the day. They were very good at persuasion. And they would use all these methods. And there are methods in, in speaking, persuasive speech, to be able to move an audience. You can move an audience by emotion and by, by stories that move people <coughs> by emotion. 
Paul said, I didn't come to do that, to try to use ulterior motives. Some people have the gift of persuasion, able to talk people into anyone, into anything. Gifted salespeople. You've probably come up against those, and it's very hard to resist their sales pitch. But there's also the temptation of the preacher to fall into the trap of someone who's using flattery for ulterior motives. And since we all love to be flattered, once we get accustomed to it from someone, we don't want to offend them in such a way that they wouldn't give us that what we want, that flattery. So we might soften our remarks to that person in such a way to stay in their good graces. And that's a trap. Covetousness, on the other hand, is found only in the heart. Very hard to detect covetousness. Only I know my own heart. It's def- difficult to detect in a minister. Is the minister only interested in compensation? Knowing the difficulty in detecting covetousness, Paul does something here. He calls God to be his witness. He says, as God is my witness, I didn't come for what I could get out of it. There was no hint of greed. In fact, look forward to verse 9, where he says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. He didn't take any monetary support from the Thessalonians. He worked day and night to support himself so that he wouldn't, they wouldn't have to give him anything. He worked at his tent making profession to support his ministry. One further thing Paul did not do, he didn't seek glory or honor from his status as an apostle. You see, he could have puffed out his chest and, and said, listen, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm one of the elite. Listen to me. But he didn't do that. He was humble in his ministry. Ministering not for honor, not for glory, but because God had given him a message of salvation. And this was a part of the secret of effective ministry that Paul had. Boldness, pure motives, unadulterated truth of the word, not seeking glory or advantage, and ministering to please only God. In verse 6, we see what Paul did not do. But in verse 7, beginning, we see what he did do. We see the power in tender and gentle love. The positive side of Paul's message comes through in verses 7 to 12. I follow along as I read. But... In contrast, we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working day and night should not be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. There's a danger in considering Christianity as simply a negative standard of saying, here's a list of don'ts. And if you keep all these don'ts, if you don't do all these things, you'll be a good Christian. And while there are certainly things that Christian should not do if his life is to match his message, Christianity consists in what we believe, in the Holy Spirit empowered life we live, and the joyful service we render. It's not a list of don'ts. Our life is to be motivated by love. And we love because he first loved us. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 5 says, And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out with our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Again, the words of Bishop Quayle. Unless a man or unless a minister be a good lover of folks, he has positively no, men, no business in the ministry of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. A successful ministry is not only good in the pulpit, but he's good in relationships also. Paul sets the standard. He's gently and tenderly cared for those believers as a mother would care for her children. He had a fond affection. He desired their well-being. He not only preached the gospel, he shared his life with them. He was involved in their lives on a personal basis because he knew that relationships take time to develop. And I feel that this is one reason why that Paul stayed for more than just the three weeks we read about in the book of Acts. He knew that relationships take time to develop. Perhaps nowhere else in the writings of Paul do we see him bearing his heart as we do here. God had transformed this proud Pharisee into a loving and a humble ministry of the gospel. If we can just consider where Paul had come from, how God had ministered in his heart, how he was a proud Pharisee who was, who was persecuting the believers because he felt they were wrong. And God had transformed him into a humble ministry minister of the gospel. The love of a mother and of a father. That's God's best plan for raising children. And they complement one another. Both need to be tender and loving and present a godly example to their children. But a father's love is also expressed <coughs> in presenting the truth of what's been called tough love. As verse 11 states, exhorting and encouraging and imploring as a father with his own children. When I had to correct my children, I often told, you, I told them, I love you too much to allow you to continue doing this. It's one of the most difficult duties of a pastor to confront a member of this congregation about questionable behavior. So that's what Paul was meaning. It's never loving to allow someone to continue in sin. And simple activity. You see, every one of us has what's called blind spots. Things which we rationalize or don't recognize as being harmful to ourselves and to our families. <coughs> and that's why strong relationships are crucial in a healthy church. Because I'm going to receive correction much easier from someone who is a friend. Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. The end result of Paul's example as a minister, the results of the things he avoided doing and the positive things he did, or well, verse 12, <coughs> that people would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls us into his kingdom. A worthy <coughs> walk. This church in Thessalonica was not perfect. Of had people in it. But the results of their witness was well known. As we read in the first chapter, Paul said, I don't have to even tell people about your church because everybody comes and tells me about it. How you turn from idols and how you, you embrace the gospel and, and how you have witnessed and, and shared the gospel throughout the whole area. These verses were not only very personally challenging to me, but they serve as a standard to evaluate ministers and ministries. May we personally and as a church be known as those who walk in a manner worthy of our calling. It's more than just believing the right things. I think we have a 
pretty good handle on believing the right things. How are we doing as far as living in accordance to those right things too? A walking in a worthy manner. And that's God's standard for us. You know, we're all ministers. Some of them, like, like myself, are vocational ministers. But every one of us are ministers. And we need to evaluate ourselves and our motives and our activities by what Paul has said. This is a key to successful ministry. May God speak to our hearts. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us in, in telling us and not leaving us just to wonder how we should live, but Father, you spell, you spell it out for us. Father, what wonderful grace you've given us. The Father, you've not only given us a standard, but Father, you've given us the Holy Spirit that that gives us the ability to do this too. And Father, as we yield to you and to your will and to the Holy Spirit working in our lives and fill with the Spirit, and Father, we can fulfill the standards you give us. Thank you that it's not just things we don't do, but so many things that you do, do also. And we thank you, Father, that we can minister to one another also as a loving mother and as a caring father. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.